Hi, I'm Trek, and you're watching Game Changer, a show where we uh, shamelessly steal ideas from video games and then bring them over to our D&D tables. And today we're taking a look at legendary resistances, something most DMs treat as a necessary evil, but it might not be as necessary as you thought considering the fact I haven't used a single one for over two years now. And if you watch this video, I'll give you the tools to make it so you don't have to either. So let's get started. Before we can talk about how to replace legendary resistances, let's dive into what it is exactly that we're replacing. If you're making a player character who specialized in debuff or crowd control in D&D, you typically start with spells like Dissonant Whispers, Bane or Vicious Mockery. Those are pretty great spells, they feel impactful to use and they can easily become one of your character's signature spells, an important part of that character's aesthetic identity. But if you already have all of these great spells at first level, where do we go from here? What can the game possibly offer you when you get a level that could catch your interest if you already have all of these tools at your disposal? Well, D&D's answer is to give you even stronger and stronger effects. You go from charm person to hold person to dominate person. The goal here is to put you in a state of always wanting to get the next big spell, the next big ability, the next level to make you want to come back for more. But as the abilities players have access to get stronger and stronger, eventually we reach a breaking point. So now you have an ability you can use at least a couple times a day, and whenever you do, the encounter just ends. But the thing is, D&D's combat is designed to be most fun when it takes about 3-5 to five rounds of combat. So if you use your encounter ending abilities on round 1, it's probably going to be a pretty anticlimactic battle. Any ally lower than you in the initiative order won't have had time to shine since the encounter ended before they got to take a single turn, and the big bad boss won't have time to do big bad things to you and your friends despite the DM trying to hype up that bad guy for the past 50 sessions. So we have a bit of a problem. We have a game that gives you a bunch of shiny toys because it wants to keep you coming back, but then that same game breaks when you actually try to use any of those shiny toys it just gave you. Legendary resistances are the solution Wizards of the Coast came up with to solve this problem. They act as a buffer and ensure boss battles last long enough to be fun. But unfortunately, they kind of miss the mark. Probably the most common complaint against legendary resistances is that they aren't fun to play against. When a monster uses one, it still feels to the player like they have wasted their entire turn. I think this stems from how you're chipping away at an entirely different win condition turning the battle into a race between the party's marshals and its spellcasters. Either the marshals reduce the monster to zero hit points before you get rid of its legendary resistances, in which case the spellcasters will have wasted a bunch of spell slots for nothing, or the spellcasters get rid of the legendary resistances before the marshals kill the monster, in which case the marshals will have wasted a bunch of turns and a bunch of attacks for nothing. And if everyone had been focusing on one life bar instead of spreading their effort between two different life bars, the battle would have been much easier it's a lose-lose situation. The second common issue with legendary resistances is that they have about as much flavor as a cup of vanilla ice cream diluted in 15 gallons of tap water. It's a trait that is systematically tacked onto about 60% of the stat blocks above challenge rating 15, so it must fit regardless of if you're fighting a spindly lich who uses intricate magics to protect itself, or a giant massive ancient red dragon who's just too tough to care about your little spells. And the way it manages to fit both of these flavors is by having none. While DMing, most of us probably improvise some kind of blend description like the vampire shrugs off your spell, or maybe we'll break the fourth wall by saying something like it uses a legendary resistance, sorry. But yeah, as a mechanic, it does not spark joy, and you know what we do with things that do not spark joy. And finally, there's a third issue with legendary resistances, the combo they have with another trait, magic resistance. If a monster has only one of those two traits, then yeah, the battle will take about 3 to 5 rounds on average, so the mechanic will have, at the very least, served its role as a buffer, even if it did that in the most unfun way imaginable. But when a monster has both traits, the game just stops functioning. Here are 10 monsters from challenge ratings 15 to 25. We'll pit them against a party of 4 fighters who are attacking every turn, and then against a party of 4 wizards who are casting banishment every turn, and then use probabilities to calculate how much time it should take on average for each party to win. If we look at the monsters with just legendary resistances, everything's fine. If we look at the monsters with just magic resistance, things look good too. 
But if we look at the monsters who have both, suddenly it takes an unreasonable amount of turns for the mages to land a single control spell on the boss. They're not acting as a buffer anymore, they're acting as a wall that you're unlikely to ever actually break through. What I have seen happen in pretty much every single game that's made it past level 10 is that the spellcasters stop casting control spells around level 10 for the most part. The big, fancy, high-level control spells that they had been looking forward to using for the past 50 sessions, they don't ever actually end up working. And as collateral damage, the weaker signature spells those same characters had been using since level 1 also kind of stop working. And I know some of you self-described evil DMs out there are going to go, well, that's what they get for trying to cheese my encounters, or it's called crowd control, not boss control. I know because I've thought the exact same thing myself in the past. But you can't really place the blame on your players for picking options that sounded good and that the game put in front of them. As the DMs, it's kind of on us to present the players with challenges that will be fun to overcome. So now, let's come up with something better. There's a pretty fundamental difference between how tabletop RPGs and video games present boss monsters. In D&D and other similar tabletop RPGs, the game gives you a list of monsters, which cover a wide range of levels or challenge ratings. You use the same system, typically stat blocks, to represent anything from a house cat to the immortal lord of all evil, which is also probably a cat. So boss monsters are basically just regular monsters that simply happen to be a bit stronger than the ones you usually fight at your current level. For example, in Pathfinder, any monster two or more levels higher than the party is considered a boss, and any monster two or more levels below the party is considered a lackey. So you can fight a level 5 flame drake at level 2, and it will be a boss, but if you fight that same flame drake at level 8, and you can probably handle 8 to 10 of them at once. But in video games, on the other hand, bosses are given a special treatment, and you almost never find a video game boss that comes back later as a lackey. There's something else entirely, they follow different rules, and that's because they fulfill a different role for the game. What a boss needs to do, above all else, is to stand out, both from regular monsters, but also from other bosses. For example, let's take God of War 3. In that game, every single boss stands out so much. They can stand out on a narrative level, like Hades, because it's the culmination of a story that spanned three games at that point. They can stand out on a spectacle level, with jaw-dropping visuals and quick-time events, like the fight against Poseidon from Gaia's back. They can stand out on a mechanical level, as every boss is usually the ultimate test of your skills at using the item you got from the previous boss. Or they can stand out on a conceptual level, because they have some sort of a gimmick, like Hermes running away from you the entire fight, Perseus turning invisible, or Kronos being so big is basically a level. That's why in video games you'll find so many bosses who are basically designed like a puzzle. Beating them is all about trying to find the solution while surviving their powerful attacks. But the thing about puzzles is, once you have the solution, you won't have fun playing the same puzzle again. So that's the first thing we're gonna change about legendary resistances. Instead of every boss monster getting that one trait every single time, I'm going to give you a selection of 20 different traits which fill the same role as a legendary resistance. So the next time you run a boss monster, you basically just need to look at the list and find a trait that you haven't used before that matches the aesthetic and themes of your next little murder kitten. For example, if you're running a Hydra as a boss, maybe you're going to give it the multiple limbs trait, but if you're running an Archmage as a boss monster, maybe you're instead going to give it the arcane deflection trait. Now let's get into the traits themselves, and I've separated them into four categories. First up is what I like to call costly resistances. Maya from Borderlands 2 is a pretty good example of this. Her signature ability, Phase Lock, suspends an enemy in the air for about 20 seconds, but it doesn't work against bosses. Instead, if you use your phase lock against the boss, you deal a good chunk of damage to it, about the equivalent of 10 melee attacks. Now the thing about Maya is that when you use your phase lock against the boss, you get something valuable, but you get something that's different from what you had bargained for, something that's different from the reason you picked Maya in the first place. So another example, slightly better in my opinion, is Golden Sun. In that game, bosses take several turns per round, a bit like how 5e bosses have legendary actions. And in Golden Sun, when a boss gets stunned, it only gets stunned until the end of its next turn, so they lose out on a portion of their action economy, but not the entire thing. So for costly resistances, the idea is pretty simple. We tie the ability for the monster to resist a negative effect to some other resource that the players care about, like hit points, action economy, or maybe some high-level spell slots, for example. And since we're making this a difficult choice for the boss, we're removing a lot of the collateral damage I talked about earlier. 
a boss is probably not going to spend 50 hit points to save against the Bane spell. It's just not worth it. So now you get to keep using that spell that you've been using for the past two years. Then we've got Destructible Resistances. My single favorite example of this is Tukohama from Path of Exile. In this boss fight, Tukohama has a special ability where he summons four totems. And until you've destroyed those four totems, Tukohama is immune to all kinds of things. Another pretty good example is Octopath Traveler. In that game, each boss is weak to up to three damage types. If you can figure out what those damage types are and then use them, Eventually, you break the monster's stance and stun it. Translate it into D&D terms, here the resistance is provided by something the players can deal with without having to rely on luck or wasting time and resources. But to the players, it will feel like they've earned the right to stun the boss rather than just bash their heads against the wall until it worked. Third, we've got multi-phase encounters. There are countless examples of this in video games from Mega Man all the way to Elden Ring, and the idea is pretty simple as well. So, your players have encounter-ending effects. Let them do it. If you plan your boss battles to basically be multiple encounters linked into one, then those spells and abilities will only end one phase of your overall encounter. And the cool thing about that is, D&D combat tends to follow a snowball curve. As the players deal with the minions and understand what the boss can do and prepare for it, at some point we just start kind of going through the motions. The outcome has kind of become obvious to everyone, we just have to do a lot to actually get there. If you've watched my last video where I mentioned the Fictian curve, you'll know that this is not how good pacing works. As soon as the players get a bit too comfortable, that's when you want to bring the tension back and up the ante. And a multi-phase encounter has a tendency to set up exactly that kind of pacing. Last but not least, we have passive threats. One example I like is Drill from Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. This Cthulhu knockoff has an attack where he throws two javelins of lightning at the ground, and they shock the entire area around where they land. The players can destroy those javelins, but until they do, even if Drill decides to go take a picnic, he's still dealing damage to them. Again, you just kind of let those encounter effects actually take hold, but then you design your boss in a way that even if they're paralyzed, they're still being a threat, just passively. It's less of a threat than if they hadn't been paralyzed, but that's okay, your control caster needs to feel like they've had some sort of an impact, right? And now the secret sauce. When I wrote this video about six months ago, I wrote that there's another way to tackle legendary resistances, and it would be to update every single save or suck spell in the game so that they still have an effect on a successful save, just a weaker one. But to be honest, that was a bit more work than I was willing to put in a single video, so I originally just mentioned it in passing. But then, about three months ago, DMs Guild creator Daniel Kahn hit me up, along with Spencer Hibnick, senior tester for MCDM, with a pitch for a book that would do exactly that thing I had decided would be too much work for me alone. So I said, let's do it, and we did it. And it's on DMs Guild. Today, this is basically another, more labor-intensive way to do costly resistances. Except what you get is always going to line up with what you had signed up for which feels so, so much better for the players. And we do that by introducing the notion of a close save. If you've used Draw Poison in your game, it's basically the same principle. If the target saves by 5 or less, they make a close save and get a weaker version of the spell's full effects. Otherwise, they make a full save and they get away scot-free. For example, we have the Dominate Person spell. And with that book, on a close save, the creature basically suffers the effect of the Charm Person spell instead. Granted, these effects will absolutely make casters even stronger than they already are, but the book gives you a bunch of options to drip feed these variant spells to your players. For example, you have the Gem of Reliable spell, which gives you one variant spell from the book at the cost of one of your attunement slots. So yeah, if any of this sounds cool, go check it out on DM's Guild. But either way, you're still getting those 20 legendary resistance alternatives for free, because that's the entire premise of the channel. PDF in the video description. That's it for today's video, about this one very specific aspect of boss battles. There's a lot more to talk about, so tell me, which video game bosses have you used as inspiration for your tabletop RPG games and why? If you want more videos like this one, make sure you like, subscribe, and all of that good stuff. You can also find me on Discord, where we talk about game design, and I sometimes share sneak peeks of what I'm working on next. Until then, have a good one.